You are listening to a pleasure podcast. For more from our sex podcast collective, visit pleasurepodcasts.com. Welcome to American Sex, the award winning podcast dedicated to challenging those puritanical, backward ass ideals that we have in the U.S. I'm Sunny Megatron, and my co host is Ken Melvoin Berg. We're sexuality educators, pleasure advocates, and ridiculous, sadistic kinksters. We're also non monogamously married to each other. So strap in or strap one on. In this house, your pleasure is power. Your kink is customizable. And your subversive perversions are revolutionary. Welcome, my friends, to episode 201 of American Sex. Today, oh, this episode is like mwah, mwah, mwah. Dr. Candace Nicole Hargens joins us for a conversation that is so good. Uh, we're going to talk about the ways that racial inequity hurts the sex lives of BIPOC folks. That's Black and Indigenous people of color. You know, a lot of people are like, but it isn't sex sex, right? It's an escape. It is a time to indulge in pleasure and leave all of the stresses of the real world behind. And aren't orgasms the great equalizer, right? Don't we all have them? And aren't they all pretty much the same? And also, politics don't belong in the bedroom, do they? Uh, well, sadly, the personal is very much political, and it's all connected. So some of what we unpack in this conversation, the cultural belief that only men who have money deserve sexual pleasure, pleasure worthiness versus entitlement, the state of both adult pleasure education and in-school sex ed and the role it plays in the bigger picture, resisting these cultural forces in our own love and sex lives when we're just trying to get from day to day and we're trying to survive and not think about these big, you know, world on our shoulders problems. Also the intersection of race, capitalism, sexual pleasure, and what we can do as allies and as BIPOC folks ourselves in our personal relationships and on a bigger scale to move the culture and subvert the system. This conversation is just, there's so much, there is so much, and it is so good. If you're not familiar with Dr. Candace, let me give you an introduction. She's an award-winning associate professor of counseling psychology at the University of Kentucky, where she studies sexual wellness and liberation. She's the host of Fuck the System, a sexual liberation podcast, and also How to Love a Human, a liberation podcast that asks people with multiple marginalized identities what the world would be like if it loved them. Dr. Candace has published over 50 research articles and it's been featured in all sorts of media from the Huffington Post to Women's Health, Blavity, Cosmopolitan, New York Times, all sorts of stuff. Before we move on to that conversation, I want to add something, something that I think will help frame what we're talking about and also give you some connection points to how this conversation may fit not only into your personal life, but also the bigger picture and how you affect that. So a lot of American fuckers, you're, you're listening. I know you consider yourself a sex positive person. You're probably socially and politically progressive, et cetera. You know, and if you're concerned about things like the pleasure gap, how uh, cis women, like people in heterosexual relationships, cis women experience a fraction of the orgasms that men do, right? And we see a lot of that on our Instagram feeds if we're in that like sex positive algorithm. But at the same time, if we're not just as concerned about uh, racial inequality, not just in the sheets, but like in the streets too, or trans rights and all of the anti-trans bills that are being introduced and sadly some passed, or the state of sex ed in our schools, or the attack on censorship on social media, on Instagram, on our Facebooks, the censorship, especially against people who are sex workers, and all of the, the pro-capitalist 
efforts that are happening right now. You know, what's going on with the workforce, with wages, with the banks collapsing, uh, with what tech efforts are being condemned by the powers that be and which are being promoted or funded. You know, step back and think about all of that stuff. It is all connected. And it's connected with the conversation we're about to have with Dr. Candace too. So as a sex positive person, if you are just like up in arms about things like the pleasure gap and the gender inequality that has led to it, awesome, because you should be. Um, But there are other things that are part of the same big old ball of wax, because they are all connected. And our last episode with Veronica Kestrel, we arrived at the same point. You know, it's like they may all seem like separate issues. We're talking about um, trans folks in the kink community, but it's like we're all ultimately fighting the same fight. Now, along those lines, there has been lots, 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 lots in the news lately. So, so much, like not, not even enough to cover in hours and hours. But the one thing that's popped up a lot in my circles is the very likely TikTok ban that is on the horizon. And there are tons of reasons why it's complete BS, you know, why this strange selective targeting of TikTok is happening. And, you know, there's conspiracy theories, there's conspiracy truths, is that what we've called them before? There's lots of opinions and lots of fishy stuff going around. I'm not going to, again, hash that all out right now. And if you're interested in some of those details or you haven't been hearing those conversations, I've actually been reposting a lot of uh, videos that I see talking about it, ironically, on TikTok. So go visit my TikTok and and all the videos of other people that I repost. You'll you'll get a lot of information. But quickly, I want to point out some of the, the the points in that that relate to this. We're all fighting the same fight concept. So a lot of folks are saying. You know, well, the agenda of banning TikTok is this is where we're sharing real news, right? We're organizing politically um, and TikTok can't be controlled by the powers that be like Facebook can or like, you know, I don't know what's happening with Twitter. It's crashing and burning. But let's look at this in relation to what we're talking about. If you're on TikTok, You know this very well. And if you're not on TikTok, you're missing a lot. You really are. This is a place where we have learned so much about ourselves, especially during the pandemic. For a lot of people, it has been the next best thing to the therapy that they can't afford. And no, I'm not saying TikTok is therapy. It is therapeutic. But, you know, times are hard. You got to you got to take the uh, healing and self-knowledge wherever you can get it sometimes, right? On TikTok, over the last, what, two, three years, we've learned about who we are. Oh, God, it's been three years. It has been three years since the pandemic started. How? Oh, my God. But really, we've learned about like who we are as people, what exactly is important in our lives, what is a bunch of bullshit that we can just push away. And all of those things, all of those conversations we've been having, all the knowledge we've been sharing with each other. It helps us access our true authenticity, like our happiness, our pleasure, and all of that stuff. And it's also a place where people can advertise their small business and not even in traditional advertising, but in a a community sort of way. You know, there are communities built around businesses, et cetera. And there's a, a vibe of just everyone supporting everybody. Also, there's tons of information there about being self-employed, working from home, opening your own business, being financially independent, like saying F you to the whole damn system and all of that stuff that we're accessing collectively and the way that we're changing and the way that we're growing gives us all access to power, not just individually, but collectively. And that helps us get out from under the thumb of the exploitation and the shame and the just, you know, 
being run down and having no time to think ness, I don't know what the word for that is, that capitalism is relying on and that the system is relying on. Okay, so think about it this way. Now I'm, I'm really getting into it. There's a quote by Stephen Biko. The most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. And spoiler, the oppressed is all of us, all of us listening. I mean, unless we've got, you know, is Mark Zuckerberg on the line? Elon, you know, okay, maybe not you, but all of all the rest of us, yes. So it's saying that the most powerful people, if they control, manipulate those who aren't in power and influence our beliefs and thoughts, they can not only maintain their control over us, but one of the ways they do it is by getting us all fighting with each other. Yeah, what's going to happen if we're all blaming each other for the situation that we're in and anything that not only brings us together, but helps us see each other's humanity and realize like, oh, we might seem really different, but we're actually not. We're all fighting the same fight and things that get us to, to think critically about those things and to be supportive and see these big pictures. That is all a huge ass threat. And along those same lines, you know, the oppression of our identity, of our pleasure, of our sense of freedom is a huge part of that strategy as well. It takes away our humanity. Yeah, TikTok is really doing a good job to combat that and they can't control it. You know, and back to economically, I mean, people are not going back to work. They are sick of being exploited for minimum wage. And TikTok is a place where we empower each other to take control of those things rather than let the circumstances of the system control us. And that is a huge threat. And the same with sex work. You know, people who have fan sites or they make clips, they are their own boss, they can work on their own time. That social media censorship affects all of us, especially sex workers. We've talked a lot about the bill SESTA-FOSTA. That's been going on since 2018. But SESTA-FOSTA and everything that's come from it has been chipping away at what we can do online. And it's all related. It's another way to cut off people's con- access to connection, to promoting their business, et cetera, to earning money. And don't forget that Facebook, which is owned by Meta, which owns Facebook and Instagram, they're all, all the same family. It has recently come out in the news, go, go hit the Google, that they hired a PR company to plant news stories in the media about TikTok over the last few years, slowly spreading this, you know, propaganda of how horrible TikTok is. Uh, Oh my God, all these things are happening. Oh, it's bad for the children. Oh, it's polluting your mind. Oh, all these bad, bad, bad things. Oh my God, the data collection. Uh, The last thing, about a year ago, Instagram started paying creators for their reels, you know, the little videos, kind of like TikTok-esque videos on Instagram. And they started paying those creators very well, like unbelievably pinch me is this real life kind of payments. I started hearing from creators who, you know, have like mid-level viral videos. So it's not like, oh, it's only the handful of the biggest influencers out there with millions of followers. No, just like regular old folks that have kind of a following, they were saying like, holy shit, I am earning thousands of dollars a month. I am paying my rent. I am putting away for sale. Like this is unbelievable, especially compared to TikTok. They have their creator fund that pays you peanuts, like cents. Uh, It's not good. 
And so Instagram was this this great thing. You know, I'm suppressed on Instagram. I've talked about this a lot, uh, which is a whole nother, a whole nother shady story. But uh, I got access to monetization for a month until they realized like, oh, we're you're supposed to be suppressed. We're taking your monetization away. And I don't have viral reels. Yeah, I post them sometimes. And uh I posted a couple things, like nothing that was a big deal. Why? In I think it was a little less than a month. I made a hundred and forty dollars posting pretty much nothing that got hardly any views. So that goes to show me people who are getting like, hey, this video got twenty thousand views, hundred thousand views more. I can see how these people were making thousands of dollars, and it was pretty easy for these folks who had followings on TikTok to strip the watermark off their video and put it up on Instagram. They're double dipping and they're making money there. Cool. So I was shocked. People were shocked. Everyone was shocked. And that money put food on a lot of creators' tables. It enticed them over from TikTok. But when this TikTok ban news heated up this week, Instagram just coincidentally happened to announce that they are completely pulling their bonuses payments. Just nothing. Stop. Done. No money. Not phasing it out. Not paying you less. Done. Cut off. That's it. Instantly, out of nowhere, you know. And th- that was a very, I don't know, you know. Like, do I do I have proof? No. Uh, do I have a hunch? Sure. Am I right? I don't know. Make your own decisions. But that was a a really interesting dick move. And also interesting timing. Do they know something we don't? I mean, it really does look like TikTok is going to get banned. So, you know, there's a lot more. I'm not going to hash into the details. Like if China really wanted our data, they could get it lots of other ways, but whatever, but whatever. Uh, I'm just planting a seed in your brain because that's some context for like big picture stuff that's going on with the it's all connected. Also watch that Pornhub documentary on Netflix. It's called Money Shot. It just came out. Go to Twitter. I was in a watch party. I tweeted a bunch of stuff. I tweeted. There's long threads with more detail from some of the people that appeared in the documentary. And maybe, just maybe, we may be having an episode about that very soon. But that whole tangled web of what happened with Pornhub and evangelical anti-trafficking groups and deplatforming consensual online sex workers all of that. There's a lot of fuckery in that documentary, and you can see how that's connected too. So just want to throw that out there. Uh, real quick, we're going to do washing the balls. We're going to wash our balls, which is housekeeping here on American Sex. There's our, our ball sparkling clean noise, and this is going to be fa- so fast your head's going to spin. One, Check out the episode description for this episode, or really any episode, but that's where you'll find all sorts of links. In this episode show notes, you'll find the links for things that we talk about in this conversation, so you can read more about them. You'll also get links to discounts, this episode sponsors, our Patreon page, access to our free Discord community, and the link to my free kink negotiation mini workbook, so check all that out. Lastly, during our sponsor breaks, you're going to hear a couple of cool trailers for two podcasts in the network that I belong to, which is Pleasure Podcast, that I love. This week, I recommend checking out Body Storytelling. I know a lot of you know Dixie De La Tour, and also Cocktails Dirty Discussions. These are two hit shows you don't want to miss. I'll have the links to those in the show notes as well. And you know what? I might do something different. Maybe leading in to our conversation, you'll get one of those trailers, and then you'll get the other one in our commercial break. But that's it. These balls, they're clean. Told you that was going to be fast. Your head is spinning. So here is my conversation with Dr. Candice about how racial inequity hurts the sex lives of BIPOC folks. And I guess we start there, but we get into a whole lot more. Oh, and first, body storytelling, then the conversation. Enjoy. Do you wish you had a cadre of fun, outrageous friends who'd share their true stories of sex, kink, or gender with you? Well, I have hundreds, nay, thousands of them, and I invite you to join us every week on the Body Storytelling Podcast for a different story told by the person who had the adventure. 
I'm sexual folklorist Dixie Delator, and the award-winning Body Storytelling Podcast features stories told live on stage in front of hundreds of people. Think Savage Love meets The Moth meets Mortified, and these stories are explicit. You name it, Body's got it. Stories from fetishists, polyamorists, swingers, kinksters, stories from queer, trans, bi, pan, the monogamish, and the open-minded. Body stories may be X-rated, but each tale has a gooey center with heart and real meaning. Body Storytelling is proud to be part of the Pleasure Podcast Network, bringing sex-positive education and storytelling to your ears. I'm Dixie Delator, and I hope you'll join me as I bring you a new uncensored story every week on the Body Storytelling Podcast. On the line, we've got Dr. Candace, and I'm super, super excited about this conversation for a number of reasons. Well, you know, one, we haven't really connected very much before. So like, I love to get to know new people. So that's exciting. But we're going to talk about something that is so important. And we don't talk about it enough. Not here, not anywhere. So Dr. Candace, you study sexual wellness and liberation. Yeah. And specifically, we're talking about today, and which is a lot of your work as well, how racial inequity hurts the sex lives of BIPOC folks. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have a very eclectic, very mixed demographic audience. You know, I have a lot of folks of color, a lot of queer folks, a lot of folks with multiple marginalized identities, Mm -hmm. and also a lot of white folks. And I love that a lot of the white folks that listen, they're like, we're accomplices, we're we're doing it. Um, But I, I notice oftentimes when I am teaching, you know, whether it's sex ed, kink ed, et cetera, to my white audiences, there is this universal given, this universal understanding that, well, you know, sex is just sex. It's kind of, Mm. it's the great equalizer, right? We all want to feel good. We all want to have orga, orga, orgums. I don't know what an orgum is, but I'll take (laughs) one. I'll try anything once. Uh, (laughs) But it's like, you know, we all have orgasms. It's great. And then, you know, the part I really hate is like, why you gotta bring politics into it? Uh, So, yeah. Why do we need to talk about this? Why is this so important? So first, thank you so much for having me because it's a joy. I don't like meeting new people. I really wanted to connect with you. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you a secret. I'll tell you a secret. I'm one of those introverted extroverts. Like I generally don't like people and I don't like meeting people, but you, I was like, you're, you fall in that exception <laughs> That's exactly, bucket. Exactly. <laughs> I'm an introvert, introvert. And I'm like, there are certain people I want to meet and certain people I never can meet. And that's fine. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. We're on the same page. I love this. Right. Right. So um, it's always interesting to me when people introduce this concept of like, why would we bring politics into it? And I'm like, when have politics not been a part of sex? (laughs) Like, walk me through the moment when we were having a political conversation when we were talking about sex, including pleasure, including health, including wellness. And so for me, it always has been and always will be. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just something that you have to be conscious of. Mm-hmm. So if we talk about, let's let's stay in the present. Like if we're talking about today, the way that people experience sexual pleasure is not a universal thing. Some people are perceived to be not as deserving of sexual pleasure as others. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that falls along class lines, like how much money people have. Sometimes that falls along along racial lines. Like um, people make assumptions about me as a black woman or, you know, people of color, like around hypersexuality are already knowing how to be really good at sex and having those expectations can be really anxiety provoking. And people make assumptions about genital size and people make assumptions about like pleasure worthiness and desirability and all of these things are kind of grounded in politics. So for me, it makes good sense to act like what we know is true is true <laughs> and mm-hmm. and talk about it. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, really, it's one of those things that, and of course, this is the way it's unfolded for me in my life. And this is the way I see it unfold for lots of folks that I work with or that I'm in community with. It's like, 
we all may start at some point or another where we don't see it as much. Mm -hmm. But then it's one of those things. It's like, once you start to see it, you can't unsee it. And it, it unwraps this like, oh, my God, everything is connected yes. to upholding a really fucked up systems. Like, it all comes down back to the same common denominator. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, once you see it, you can't unsee it. So if I'm doing my little tiny part in the world, I hope to be for a lot of people, maybe that one, that first like, wait a minute. Because mm -hmm. I know if I'm going to get you to see it, we're going to get people to see it in this next you know, hour or whatever. They can't unsee it. <laughs> yes. So that's our, that's our master plan. Ah. No, but um, yeah, it's, you know, we bring our identities into the bedroom, into our yeah. kink, into our role play. And I, I often say like, it's subversion through perversion, whether mm -hmm. we realize we're doing it or not. Mm -hmm. And of course, when you have more privileged identities, that's what you're bringing into the bedroom. And that's yeah. not to like diss anyone and be like, oh, my God, you're more privileged. Get a clue or anything. No, 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 no. not at all. Um, it's, you know, we, we all have our certain vantage points in life. We all have certain privileges and, and certain not privileges to varying degrees. So it's just kind of the way it is. Absolutely. I always like to lead with like how many privileged identities I have, because I think it grounds the conversation is I'm not coming in here. One, I'm not coming here as a victim. And I'm also not coming here as a blamer, because I think that stops the conversation before it even has a chance to start. Like I'm a cis woman, I'm heterosexual, like, you know, I'm edu well educated. All of these are privileged identities that mean something when people des decide what I get to say about sex or what I don't get to say about sex. So if we if we get to acknowledge that in the bedroom or before we even get to the bedroom on the kitchen floor, wherever we're going to be. Like, yeah, I yeah. Think, I think if I think it helps us have richer sexual experiences. Take, for example. So the one thing I mentioned is how we have politics around genitalia, mm -hmm. genital size, genital color, but how lady look, all of these things. Right. They have some racial underpinnings to them. So the expectations that you have for penis size based on whether a person is black or Asian or white or Latinx, we can we can pretend like that doesn't exist. But when you get into a dating app, especially kinkier dating apps, people are going to make it known what they think is what they think is associated with whom. Yeah. 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 It is. It's just so ingrained in. Our culture, you know, from from TVs, tropes, like mm -hmm. anything you can think of. And it's like, no matter how hard we try to avoid it, or how much in our when we're being very intentional and conscious, we're like, well, of course, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a stereotype. It's in there. <laughs> it's in there. Like, you know, it's in our little lizard brains. And we're all working to undo that, you know, no matter our, our identities, our levels of privilege, we've all got it to some varying degree. Um, and I love because, you know, I'm a kinkster. So yeah. I love playing with that. We have an excuse mm -hmm. to be like, we're going to play with some power dynamics, yes. you know, whether you get to work it out in that space. Yeah. In that play. Yeah. And we don't have to say and we're doing it because that's political. And I'm going to learn this or that. And let me write some stuff down for my therapist. And because some people like are like, that's not sexy. We can just do it to do it. And it still kind of rubs. Up. I, I call it like, um, you know, when you're on your computer and let's say you're I don't know, playing a game or something and it's like a thing pops up, like when your operating system is updating, but it'll happen in the background. So you can keep mm -hmm. working. You won't even know. It's like our operating system is updating. I love that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. While we're just having some pervy, dirty fun, doesn't feel like work, but yeah, we're getting that systems update, which is... Isn't that the fun way to do it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, oh, you yes. have pleasure and nastiness and... <laughs> Yeah. And a system update. like <laughs> It totally is. Totally is. So, okay, let's dig into some specifics. Because I know, like, you know, when when folks are talking about this and, you know, seeing it and, and yeah. peeling back that onion, it's really, or it's easier. I'm not going to say it's easy. It's easier to get this on a conceptual level. But once we 
put it into, you know, how does this look in somebody's day to day life? And how does this affect people, situations, etc? That's where it gets hard for folks to either imagine if it's not their experience, or even imagine sometimes when it is their experience, because we like to fool ourselves into thinking yeah. shit that's happening is not happening. So let's go into some specifics. There was one thing that you had said that I was like, hmm, Hmm, let's let's go down this road. Okay, let's go. You know, cultural ideas like quote broke boys don't get no pussy, and still a sense of inadequacy when black men are unable to meet those financial requirements. So let's dig into that. Yes. What does that mean? Give us give us some context. What does that look like in day to day life? Okay, we're gonna take it to this from the system to the sexual, right? Exactly. So. Yeah, we're doing it. <laughs> Right. So the system is economic inequality based on racism and capitalism. So if some people are more likely to be hired into high paying jobs and some people are not, usually you see that along racial lines where black men, especially if they have black sounding names, might not be hired, might not even be interviewed for certain jobs. So we set this benchmark of financial success and achievement for a person's sexual desirability. And then when Cardi and City Girls and other other artists say, broke boys don't deserve no pussy. I know that's right. And it's like, wait a minute. I don't even have access to the financial means to realize that to realize myself out of brokenness, to get out of being broke. Does that mean I'm undeserving of pleasure? Does that mean that I don't I don't get to experience something good with someone else because I don't have that? So that's one small way that like the intersection of racism and capitalism show up in hip hop music, show mm -hmm. up in dating preferences and sexual preferences. And it's not to say that it's realized all the time. Like there, my research suggests that broke boys are getting plenty of good pussy, right? But, but yeah. then your sense of sexual self around that, like, do I have to overperform or outperform others? Is this all I'm worth comes up? Cause I've had so many men, black men in particular, who've been clients, or who have worked with as research participants who've been like, I'd like to be able to say no to sex sometimes and yeah. feel like that's okay. Like, you know, having conversations about consent where they don't even feel like they get to say no. It's like, this is all I have to bring to the table when mm. it's not. Yeah. That, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, my, my brain is going into a bunch of different directions. Like I'm seeing the mind map of my brain. Yeah. There's a circle of what we talked about and it's like shooting off into 18 different directions. So I often like to put myself in the mind of the listener who's yeah. like processing and going, but, but what about, but, but, but what about, and my imaginary, but, but what about is, okay, let's say I am a woman who has been in uh, abusive relationships mm. and this is ripped from the headlines. Okay. This mm -hmm. is not made up. Uh <laughs> So and and part of those abusive relationships were, you know, seeing the potential in mm. somebody or being subject to manipulation. And oftentimes that would translate into getting into a relationship, maybe having kids where it's like you're the single mom working and he's sitting on the couch watching Bugs Bunny drinking beer. Um, so where do we balance that like I need to either express outwardly or you know and that that purpose could be to instill in myself like watch your ass don't be a sucker don't get manipulated mm -hmm. versus I am negatively perpetuating these cultural stereotypes yeah. so like if I'm in that position where do I find that middle ground that's such a good question I think so many people come with that because they think how do I protect myself in this situation from being exploited or hurt again? Mm -hmm. And if you associate the person who exploited or hurt you with everybody in that economic class, that's a stereotype, right? Yeah. So it's like, okay, one person who didn't have financial means was hurtful, maybe two people, you know what I mean? Like they were hurtful to you. There's so many ways that that, that aspect of their class status was not the thing that hurt you. Maybe it was their personality. <laughs> Maybe it was their own, you know, their own shame and perpetuation of harm, like based on gender as opposed mm -hmm. or sexism as opposed to their class status. So it's like you think you're going to be protected if you find a guy that's not 
poor or not broke. And then you find out that they participate in economic exploitation all the time, too. It's not it's not it's not like you are just writing off a whole class of guys because of the harm of uh, one person or another. You see the same thing when you see like media and it shows one image of criminal. And so that's the image of criminal that comes to mind when somebody says, what, who is violent? Who is going to steal? Who is going to do harm? But we know our history in the United States. So we Mm -hmm. recognize that (laughs) the history of the United States might suggest that a whole racial group are criminals and genocidal and exploitive, but we don't make those same associations. So I always say, give yourself room to breathe around your pain because your pain is legitimate. But don't make that the thing that determines who your next partner will be or how you measure other people's worth. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. And okay, so that is like, mm, yes. Mm, uh. And I'm, pu- I'm still putting myself in the mind of, of the listener, um, which maybe was the mind of myself at like 26, you know? Yeah. Uh, so- yes. <laughs> yes. I've Might have been, been all of us at exactly. one point in time because we get socialized into the same things, right? Right. Yeah. And it, it, for me, you know, I'm I'm going to be 52 this year. It has been a process to unpack, yes. you know, in my own life, like, why do I repeatedly find myself in these very exploitative situations and romantic relationships. And that that's a whole, you know, that's a whole nother episode. It's a whole nother mm-hmm. podcast. Like, look, we can go down that road. We <laughs> yeah. get there together, girl. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So like, I'm imagining me at like, you know, 26 or whatever, just starting to realize I, oh, exactly what you said. Right. And then I'm like, okay, so where do I begin to like, parse this out within myself because like you know looking back at where I am now you know hindsight's 2020 but back then I was so I don't know if it's you know in the muck of all, everything society's told me and things I believed about myself like you know you lie to mm-hmm. yourself you you it's so hard to pick apart like what's reality and what is you know I'm completely going down the wrong road thinking I know why this is happening blah, 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 blah. so like if I'm in that situation and I don't have an amazing therapist which like a lot of people either it's not feasible to either have access to an amazing Mm -hmm. therapist or maybe they have access to therapy, but trying to find an amazing one is, Mm -hmm. you know, that's a whole nother uh, ball of wax. So like the therapist, you're right. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So like, where would I start to try to unpack that for myself? Yeah. I usually start with when I'm working with clients, I start with what do you think will happen if you're alone for a while? How well do you tolerate loneliness, the discomfort of the fear of the the retribution that comes from you from society for being a single person or being alone? Because the reason why you don't get out can be that you're afraid or that you don't feel like you have any recourse, like you don't have you're hopeless, you're afraid or you're hopeless. Right. So I always begin there. Walk me through no judgment at all. Walk me through what you're afraid of here. Like, what will it feel like? It's going to, I feel desperate. I feel overwhelmed. I feel, I'll feel abandoned. You know, I don't want to hurt anyone. I want to save somebody. All of these things come up. Right. And then when you, when you give a person permission to just name what is to be with that, then they can make more informed choices. And that might mean they still stay like, okay, now I know this because insight doesn't mean you're going to change your behavior immediately either. It's like, now I know this. What does that mean for me? Are there ways I can communicate with my partner what I want and still be in this relationship? Because you don't have to throw people away just because there's been some harm there. There are ways to repair. But if not, what do I need to do for myself and with myself so that I can be prepared to be alone for a little while? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Okay. I don't know if you just, I don't know. It's not like inner child work. You spoke to my inner 26 year old. And it's like, if I. Like, I hear you now saying that, and I'm like, yes, yes. <laughs> my 26 year old self, way, you know, back in my brain is like, I'm not afraid to be alone. I'm not as, a, what do you mean? I'm an independent. I'm, you know, I'm a grown up, and, you know, all that stuff. My 26 year old self would have said that too. 
And it would have been a lie. You know? <laughs> yes, yes. So it's like, I don't know what the point is here because I hate to be like, you know, it's weird being in my 50s and like having adult children and that balance between, well, I've lived through life and I told you so and I know exactly what's happening and you're to, because like no one's going to listen to that shit. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> even though inside my brain, I'm like, oh, girl, oh my God. <laughs> So, yeah, maybe I'm saying this because, like, if you're that, you know, whatever, you don't have to be 26 year old. You know, I I was still that at like 37 years old, and you know, maybe older. And there are some folks that are, you know, still, still in there in there at 62 years old or whatever it is. No shame, no shame. Like we are all undoing the yeah. mind fuck that society has instilled upon us. Yeah, because there's like partner privilege, right? So you are perceived a certain way when you are partnered yes. with the privilege of saying, you know, this is my person and it can be a shitty ass relationship, but I have a person. So that means something about my value and my worth in the world because somebody chose me. And if you're not really willing to divest from that privilege, then it's going to be very hard to be communicative in your relationship, to get what you want sexually, to to transgress all of these, you know, systems of oppression because you, you like the way that privilege feels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if, if, you know, American fuckers sitting there listening, if you're, if a little bit of this is resonating, no shame. No, mm -hmm. I know it's hard to be like, oh, have I been lying to myself my whole life? But like, unpack that a little bit. Yeah. Unpack <laughs> because may maybe, uh, <laughs> So I think that, you know, digging into that is a good place to start because we can talk about all these like higher level things about like why mm -hmm. uh, BIPOC folks can't really harness their pleasure and why all of this affects their sex life. But I like digging into like, okay, this is how it is in real life mm -hmm. and it's not easy. So let's pull back a little bit okay. and unpack a little bit more of these examples of how we see folks' sex lives affected by this inequality. Let's talk about Black women who are financially dependent on a partner or even, you know, maybe it's financially, maybe it's situationally, maybe it's, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. How does that translate to going right into the bedroom and affecting mm -hmm. pleasure? So when you have an imbalance in reliance in a relationship, so there's not reciprocity, mutuality in the relationship, it makes it really tough to have good sexual communication. It's not impossible because sometimes like, you know, we, we talk about the kink community, BDSM work and all of that. Sometimes you contract to be like, I am dominant person in this relationship. These are my roles. This is what I'm going to do. And you're you're in agreement with that. There's some consent around that. But if it's not a consensual imbalance mm -hmm. in the relationship, it can make it really tough. And in, in, in some ways, because of racist oppression or sexist oppression, the intersection of that, like mm -hmm. gendered racism, Black women might be in the position or women of color in general, you know, might be in the position where they're at the bottom of that imbalance. And that means how do you negotiate condom use when you're at the bottom of an imbalance? Mm. How do you negotiate when to say stop and when to say go? You know, wh what consent looks like? Is it ongoing or do people push your boundaries all the time? Um, if something isn't pleasing to you, if something is painful to you, will people even listen or give you the benefit of the doubt? Like that's the way that it, seeps into our sexual lives uh -huh. because we think it's just happening in the work world in the education world and all of that stuff trickles down into your intimate space your intimate justice is the playground that i like to work with people on where it's like can you ask for what you want and will there be relationship sanctions when you do yeah that's huge that's mm -hmm. huge like yeah i think about you know again to my Taking it back to my perspective, how much self-censoring I yeah. did 
Yeah. Just in anticipation of in like, anticipation. yeah, That's I know it. this isn't yes. going to go well. I know that they're not going to listen when I push back on this. I'm just going to choose my battles. I'm going to, you know, maybe, yeah, I have boundaries when it comes to the big things, but those smaller boundaries, mm-hmm. I'm just going to let go. And, you know, <sighs> Yeah, that's a that's a, a lot. Yeah, that's absolutely. a lot. And it's not I like to take it away from just like choices you've made or choices a person's made because many times that's how you've been socialized to be polite. You know, so women of all races and genders, femmes in general probably have had many of these types of socializations. Be polite, be nice, don't hurt anybody's ego. And so then you find yourself self-silencing because you're trying to protect that you've been socialized to do it. And then there probably have been some times where you've had consequences when you spoke up consequences that felt painful or really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And when I ask people to step into courage, I'm doing that with the acknowledgement that you might still feel terrified, but for you to have the sex that you deserve for you to have the pleasure you're worthy of, And for it to be a mutually beneficial experience, not just a one-sided thing, you've got to be courageous enough to ask. And your partner's response to that will let you know if they're the type of person you get to, you will be able to enjoy good sex with. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, that's a hard place to dig in. It's like, again, that retrospect for me, I didn't ask those questions because I knew what the answers were. And I yeah. knew that they weren't great. And I knew if I found out the answer to those questions, I would realize I'm not in a great relationship or I'd yeah. be facing a breakup. Or so it's like, did I consciously go, well, I know the answer to this question. I'm not going to ask. Right? No, it was like subconsciously. Mm-hmm. I didn't know it at the time. That's rough. And it's like, then we get back to the systemic inequality. Let's say I'm in a relationship where it's like, I can't financially uh, make it, or I don't think that I can, you know, um, I am reliant on my situation for X, Y, Z reasons. Um, so then I, you know, it's like one, I think about like, if I'm the person in that situation, how do I parse that out and and like get the courage to face that? But secondly, I'm thinking about everybody else, right? I think about the kink community and, you know, we we like to say how inclusive we are, and 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 in a lot of respects, depending on the com- the yeah. community, is a misnomer. But you know, right. the little tiny communities, they're all different. But in in the communities I've experienced, of course, there's been some really fucked up shit, um, mm-hmm. and of course, there's been people that think they're they're like trying to look out for, but it's like, oh, you are stepping in it, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, So let's say I am a white person in community with folks that maybe do have, um, you know, their, their BIPOC identities have these things affecting their pleasure. And I just, I don't see it, but I listened to this podcast and it, planted the seed. And now I'm starting to see it. Like, so what would you recommend for, for people in community with these folks? And then these folks themselves who are trying Mm to, I don't know, reconcile their situations and their pleasure. I think everybody is going to fuck up from time to time. I don't have any blame or shame to give for folks who fucking up. I'm going to, I'm going to be as compassionate around that with people who are white, people who are hetero, people who are cis, people who are, you know, like all of the privileged identities as I am with myself, because I understand that we're all human beings. So rupture is a part of the process. You just got to learn how to repair Mm -hmm. and everybody's repair strategy is going to be different. Like, so what someone in your community might need as an apology or as a repair strategy, you got to ask them for that, right? There are different ways that you can make make amends, repair, apologize. Um, Because sure, you're going to fuck it up, get it wrong sometimes. Like you might end up tokenizing someone that's a person of the global majority in a kink space. You might end up fetishizing someone in play. And if they come back to you and give you that feedback, it's likely because they trust you enough to hold it and to do something with it. And so then you, you know, you have that conversation like, here, here's how I heard you. I understand what pain feels like. So I get that you're saying that that caused you pain, 
regardless of what my intention was. Here are some things that I can do to make amends, to make it up. I apologize. I sincerely don't want to do that. Any all of the ways that you, you know, just apologizing to people. So being willing to accept correction and feedback to me is such a primary step. That's in all spaces. And especially as it relates to sex, because you are typically at your most vulnerable, your your most powerful, but also your most vulnerable, your most intimate, you're naked, you're connected, you're exposed, you know, you're doing things that that mean something to you on an erotic level, which Mm -hmm. is a really deep level. And so it can feel tricky to come back from that and be like, damn, I I harmed you and I didn't mean to. But if you can say that, I think you've you've taken a really big step. Yes. Yeah. And I just, I want to highlight something for folks that you said that to me, you know, once I, I realized this and you put into words, it really helped stuff click. It's like, yeah, if somebody tells you that means they care enough about you. Like that's a gift that mm-hmm. somebody trusts you enough to be like, hey, let's talk about this fucked up thing that happened. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I know like for me, just in my own life, if it's those are the people, A, that I care about, B, mm-hmm. that I know have the capacity that's to, to the capacity. learn and to grow and to not take it so personally and then be an asshole. Blah, 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 blah. Because if you're that person, I'm just not going to say jack shit. And mm-hmm. I'm just going to separate myself from you because it's not worth my time and energy and effort yeah. to have this really deep, emotional, vulnerable, for me, like really risky for me conversation with you because maybe I'm wrong. And you are that asshole. Mm -hmm. So like, I really encourage folks to, you know, who, who do like when, when people have those, bring up those hard conversations with them to really look at it that way. Like you are cared about enough and valuable enough to that person to have this conversation with. Yeah. Yeah. Which is like, Oh, that's, you know, light bulb moment. Ah, that's so. I like how you said it's a gift. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It it really absolutely is. And like, yeah, you know, I've been on both. I've been the giver of the gift and I've been the receiver of the gift. You right. Know? Yeah. <laughs> like, like, oh, yes. Oh, yes. And uh, as the giver of the gift, a lot of times I still get burned, mm-hmm. you know, and it's like, that's. So don't, don't burn me. Don't be one of those people. Yeah, yeah. Okay, fill in the blank. You ready? I deserve a sex life that is what? What comes to mind? Don't be afraid to say it because whatever it is, you deserve it. And Dipsy can help you fill in that blank. Dipsy is an app full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories, and they bring scenarios to life with immersive soundscapes and realistic characters. You can hear about second chance romances, adventurous vacation flings, or hot and heavy hookups. Dipsy brings variety and inclusivity, too, with stories geared towards queer listeners, plus Over half are voice acted by people of color. Oh, and get ready to hear celebrities like you have never heard them before. Listen to stories voiced by Sharonis J. Jackson, ER Fightmaster, and Luke Cook. And not only is new content released every week, they also have soothing sleep stories, wellness sessions, and sexy stories that you can read. Let Dipsy be your go-to place to spice up your me time, explore your fantasies, relax and unwind, or heat things up with a partner. For listeners of American Sex Podcast, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash sunny. That's S-U-N-N-Y. Now that's 30 days of full access for free when you go to D-I-P-S-E-A stories.com slash sunny. That's dipsystories.com slash sunny. You know what really stinks? For as much as we want to say to heck with the system, for right now, at least, uh, if we want to survive our day to day and <gasps> gasp, even consider having nice things sometimes, we still have to play by the rules of the nonsensical games like credit scores. And don't even get me started on how 
I, nope, I'll go on for an hour. This is only a 60 second ad. Reel it in. The point is, like it or not, your credit score determines if you qualify for that apartment, that car loan, even sometimes that job. Well, enter Kickoff, the easiest way to build credit fast. In fact, Kickoff is the number one credit building app and has helped over a million people take control of their credit. If you have no credit or you just want to boost your score, you can get started in less than five minutes with no credit check, no hidden fees and no interest. Plans start at just $5 a month, and every on-time payment you make with Kickoff is reported to the major credit bureaus, and when they see healthy habits, you see a score boost. Win, win. Kickoff has a 4.9 out of 5 rating in the App Store and over 44,000 rave reviews. Even Forbes and NerdWallet say it's a smart way to build credit fast. So don't let your credit control you. Go to kickoff.com and start building better credit in less than five minutes. Really, don't put it off. That's K-I-K-O-F-F dot com to take control of your credit right now. Build your credit the easy way right now at kickoff.com. What's up, you guys? We are Cocktails or Discussions. I'm Kiki Said So. And I am Medina Monroe. And if you love talking about dating in today's world, all the things in between, check out our show. Yeah, take a listen to one of our favorite episodes. Mm. Everybody <laughs> fluid for real. Everybody just going with the flow, goddamn. Yes, Some women know. can't call themselves fluid if you try not to eat pussy. You what? talking about, well, I don't eat pussy. But you scared of a little fluid. You don't be a little scared of fluid now what if you fluid. That fluid tastes good. <laughs> if you have been dating someone for six years, and you find out that your boyfriend of six years is your brother. Like, full, both same parents. It's It'd be weird if they do stop. They had family reunions and you looking at it like, damn, I know my sister got good pussy. <laughs> I'm gonna mm. stay. Check out new episodes of Cocktails Dirty Discussions every Thursday on your favorite podcast app or YouTube. Okay, so... When it comes to folks who, you know, are seeing it, they're like, oh, shit, this is connected. The whole mm-hmm. systemic fuckery is all connected. Oh, my God. Well, what the hell can I do about it? Because, sure, I can show up in somebody's life uh, one-on-one in a personal yeah. relationship, and I can, you know, receive the gift. I can do all the things. I can try to understand my privilege and how everything intersects. But... This is a systemic issue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this is bigger than just in the bedroom. So what might I do, whether I'm, you know, whether I'm one of those people who has a lot more privilege and I'm I'm not a BIPOC person, or maybe I am. What are things that I can do to affect the bigger system? Yeah. Okay. There's so many things that we can do related to advocacy and policy change. And that's systems level work, right? Mm -hmm. My main thing that I've been sharing with folks is talk to your city councils and your school boards about what type of sex ed they are promoting in the schools, because that is going to shift the culture, right? The policy around abstinence only sex ed, um, sex ed that is not not gender affirming, that is heterosexist, that is racist, like that is sexist, phallocentric, like all of these little nuances that you don't even think about around sex ed really are giving us, they're the first time many of us get scripts about sex. Mm -hmm. So even if you take it there and you look for, they have some really great sex ed curriculums, the Women of Color Sexual Health Network created a bunch of good sex ed curricula. If you say to your school board, real simple things like that, what kind of sex ed curriculum are you using? This is the one I think we should use because it's the most inclusive. Yeah. And that means that a whole generation of kids don't have to sit through. I don't know if you sat through this or I know I sat through it where the the cis boys, the cis girls get separated. Yeah. And we got the little handout, like the little uh, like tchotchke tampon goodie bags and like you get the little goodie and, bags. Yeah. And <laughs> then my my sex ed instructor, who was a gym teacher, who was likely not at all prepared to have this conversation was like, don't be some boy's trash can. And I'm like, is sex a trash can? Yes. Now, I was a precocious kid. So I wasn't having any of that. I was already I had already made my sexual debut by the time that conversation was had in the schools. But imagine if it would have been an affirming conversation, which is saying, you know, there are lots of systems that we're dealing with that impact 
what age you might want to make your sexual debut. When do you know you're ready? What does consent look like? You know, how do you make your decisions about who is desirable and who is not? You know, what is TV telling you about who's a good partner, who deserves to get pleasure and who doesn't? Like, let's unpack those things. If your sex ed is doing that, as opposed to here's the trash can, don't be it. That can make a big difference. So that's just one small thing folks can do. Sex related, specific to it, local, Mm -hmm. in your own community. Yeah, yeah. And I would love for you, because I know what you mean. I love this language. What do you mean by sexual debut for those who haven't heard the term? Sexual debut is my resistance terminology to words like losing your virginity. Like, so sexual debut is like, I emerge into the world as a sexual being, partnered or unpartnered. So a masturbation is a sexual debut with a partner is a sexual debut. You know, you can have your partnered and solo ones as opposed to like losing virginity, which I didn't lose anything. I shared something with someone yeah. and it was a wonderful experience. So I think I use the term sexual debut in that way. I, I love I love that term. And that's just one example of things that we say all the time in society, oh, yeah, lose your virginity. We don't even think about like mm-hmm. the 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 subconscious connotation. You get into that puritanical part so much. I love that about your show. And you're like, losing your virginity, losing my virginhood is puritanical as fuck. Like, it totally is. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, you know, little things like that. Again, it's like once you once you see that. You see like, oh, shit, I thought that was just harmless. Like, you're right. Oh, my God. I never thought. Then you're going to see all the other shit. American fuckers, just get ready. You got your glasses on now. Um, And so I think about sex ed in schools. And, you know, for me, I have two adult children that are AFAB, you know, assigned female at birth. And uh, it was interesting because I we moved back and forth from Chicago to Northwest Indiana. And those are very, very different, politically different, culturally different. Uh, In Chicago, when it came to sex ed, I was blown away at my uh, youngest, like seventh or eighth grade sex ed. Sure. They learned about fallopian tubes and, you know, the mechanics, Mm -hmm. but they had such a strong unit on consent and how consent looks. That. Yeah, it was it was like not just in sexual situations, because really consent is consent. It's not just sex. It's, mm-hmm. you know, so they approach it. How you how you hear like this is how they learn sex ed in Sweden when they're five. They start talking about consent. It was like felt like that sort of flavor. But that. then there was like examples like, you know, it was it was like gender neutral. Like Taylor and Pat are dating and they're making out after school and. Taylor is fine with Pat taking off their shirts, but they don't want to go any further. Like, how would that, how would navigating that consent look? Mm-hmm. And, and I'm like, whoa, what? I this love is that. Fucking amazing. What curriculum is that? Yeah, it was we sh- made it in Kentucky. It, it was, sh- <laughs> yeah, Kentucky. That's a whole, we'll get there. We'll get there. Mm. Uh, Chicago public schools, like my kids were in an inner city school, and I was blown away blown away and they had people they actually hired sex educators to come in it wasn't like the gym teacher did part of it but then they hired folks that specialized in this stuff to come in and so that was like oh my god that was amazing then I think about my my youngest who uh, and I just want to say, I, t- I was just on a podcast called Fat Chicks on Top and talked about how I had the sex conversation with my youngest. And people think like, oh, it's easy for you. Oh, it was so awkward. It was so, it was so It's going to be awkward sometimes. Oh my it goodness. It is. Yeah. It, yeah. So like, for me, if it was awkward, if it's awkward for you, listener, it's okay. Like, it's going to be awkward. You'll get better at it. You will. You will. But like, she got in trouble because... She said something about like they they could talk about pregnancy, but they couldn't talk about intercourse. And this was Mm. Northwest Indiana Mm -hmm. public school curriculum. And so she raised it was fifth grade first sex ed. She raised her hand and she's like, you know, so I don't know what it was like. So when people have intercourse and they make the baby and the teacher was like, get to the principal's office right now. 
And she's like, what? They couldn't talk about intercourse. Wow. But they were talking about everything else. They were talking, they did the used, chewed up piece of gum. They did that. Yep. And I'm like, these two places are 30 miles away from each other. I was just, oh, so you're in Kentucky. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I've taught at University of Tennessee Sex Week. And, and I was like, wow, I'm the first sex ed y- y'all college students have ever had. Wow. Yeah. Um, so, it's a shame. Yeah. So, A, what is it like in those states where uh, we don't have access to this kind of sex ed? And then I want to get into like, then as individual people, especially parents, mm, mm-hmm. who maybe we don't know all of the stuff to teach our own kids, what can we do if we've tried and tried and tried to change the school board, but we can't? Yeah. So yeah, let's talk about what it's like in some of those areas and then what we can do. In many places in the South in particular, the areas where the HIV rates are the highest, the areas where the unintended pregnancy rates are the highest, they also have surprise, surprise, the worst sex education in schools. Mm -hmm. So the Bible Belt thinks that they're doing something morally right by promoting abstinence only sex education, when in fact, you're just not giving young people the tools to make informed, healthy sexual decisions. And so when you don't give people the tools, they're still going to do what they're going to do. They're just going to do it misinformed. And then they're going to perpetuate misinformation among their peers or porn is going to be the thing that gives them their education. Like porn is information, but it's not education for the most part. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think that a lot of folks think that they're quote unquote, protecting their kids. This is the language that we hear a lot when people defend against changing those curriculum. We're protecting our children's innocence. Yeah. What about their health? Would you like to protect their well-being? Would you like to promote their well-being? And I think if we can start to think about promoting health and promoting well-being and what it actually takes, that's one step. Mm. The second step is some people are really committed to their ideas and misinformation that supports their ideas is going to be welcome. And it doesn't matter if it's fact-based and it doesn't matter if it's correct because it feels morally superior to them. And that lens usually is coming from all of these systems, right? It's like this is what a family should look like. It should be a man and a woman and they should have sex one time to, pro- you know, procreate. And that's it. Like we have all of these scripts that come from, you know, fucked up systems and people buy in wholesale and then they try to sell it too. So I think that, you know, that's the stuck place that we can be in, in the South. And that's why it takes people who listen to this podcast, people like us, to be actively involved, even when your kids are grown or not in schools anymore, to say, hey, this is what we want to see for young people. But also, this is what we need for ourselves as grown people who got trash ass sex ed when we were kids. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And um, so I forgot what the second part of the question is, but for the first part, that's it. Like I I do stuff in churches. I talk about sexual health in in church spaces and community event centers. I, me and my team work in a school for people who are teen parents and we do comprehensive sex ed there. Like we're actively involved in the community and doing that work as sex educators, therapists and researchers Mm -hmm. doing that work because otherwise we're just going to leave our kids to the wolves and we're not with it. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Oh, good. So much, so much. Uh, so again, I'm putting myself in the mind of a listener. Let's say I live in Kentucky and I have, you know, teen kids or uh, I don't know, grade school kids, whatever. And I want my kids to learn a, a more balanced view of sex and sex ed. Yeah. I understand the value of that. However, I had the shitty sex ed, so I don't understand mm-hmm. the details, even though I understand Mm-mm. conceptually this needs to happen. And they're not learning it in, in school in my area. Yeah. And and like all the other kids uh, and all the other parents are have this conservative thinking and they're you know, homophobic and we don't want drag queens and, you know, the whole mm-hmm. I live in one of those areas, right? Yes. What can I do? Can I can I go online and be like, let me Google to see if there's like sex ed for me as a parent talking to my yes, kids, or, or are there classes <laughs> for like the kids? Like, where do I go and what do I do? 
my one of my favorite online is sex positive families. Mm -hmm. So it's on Instagram and it gives you different developmentally appropriate ways to talk to your kids about sex. So when they're three and four, like I have a toddler son, he's four. The way I talk to him about his genitalia and consent right now, those and and who gets to touch him and who doesn't get to touch him. Those are developmentally appropriate ways of having sex education with the four year old. And when I talk to him at seven and nine, seven to nine, my conversation will be a little bit different. When he's 13, it'll be a bit different. Incrementally, we'll go a little bit deeper. And whenever he has questions, I'm open to answering them. Sex Positive Families kind of walks you through what that can look like mm -hmm. stage by stage. So I really like their curriculum for that. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. And I, I think that, you know, there are probably a lot of people that fall into that bucket there. They're like, conceptually, I know this needs to happen. I just don't know, yeah, I don't know where to, to do begin. Or say. I don't, you know, and again, this is kind of the one of one of the things once you see it, you can't unsee it and it's everywhere. It's like we are products of how we were raised in the society, which yeah. we, you know, all of the things that you are talking about take really good self-knowledge, take really good boundary setting, take emotional literacy or knowledge or whatnot. Mm -hmm. And those are things that purposely are, you know, we are denied access to. And mm -hmm. I'm going to get like big and conceptual and just straight to the point because it's like, if we had those things, we would be able to easily call out bullshit, not mm -hmm. just in our personal lives, but in our society. And we would refuse to be as exploitatable as we are. And the whole yeah. fucking system would crumble. Uh yeah. <laughs> if we get to build a new one that's more loving, caring, equitable, and people don't want to see the utopia, you know, like they, yeah. they want capitalism to thrive and all of these systems of oppression to thrive. And so, sure, there are some forces against it because we have been as a collective of sex educators, creators, um, like we have been working and doing this for a while. Like you're not new to this. And so there have been strides made. And then you see the backlash that we're going through now because the strides were striding. Like we were doing all, we were doing all right. We're learning some things. Our kids are understanding themselves as sexual beings. They understand themselves as gendered and sex and race and they get it. And they're willing to transgress a lot of that stuff. And so people have feels about that. So like, you're not as easily exploitable when you're critical thinking. Right. We can't teach you any of this stuff in school. Like let's change, let's make CRT a thing and, uh, and ban, and ban it from schools. Let's ban books. Let, you know, let's. Let's not have drag queens in the libraries. Let's not even expose our children. You know, all of these, all of these are backlash to some really good work being done. Mm -hmm. That means we got to stay the course. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess it, it you know, I, I've been a little depressed. But I'm like, oh my God, everything is horrible. Mm -hmm. But it's like, yeah, I guess that is a reframe. It's like, it's because we've been doing such a good job at this mm -hmm. that th they're like oh shit red alert mode let's right. let's put you know 300 some odd anti-trans bills into local governments and take away abortion right it is a coordinated right we're talking about removing people's reproductive health options banning whole gender classes of people from being in public space or being named using the pronouns that best connect to who they are like all of these things they they are coordinated efforts but what one of my one of my colleagues says it's extinction burst so when these ideas have to die you know you're going to see a burst of energy trying to preserve them before they got to go for good yeah. that's why we got to stay the course yeah yeah absolutely so yeah to the folks who 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 walked into this you know uh conversation like oh it's a sex podcast and now they're coming out having an existential crisis uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry not sorry uh, <laughs> but um yeah this is how it's all connected this is how you know it's like Oh, pleasure in the bedroom. It are, don't we all have orgasms? Aren't they all the and same? We don't. Right. Right. And we don't all have orgasms at the same rate. And that's unfortunate. We yeah. know that. Like we know the stats on how heterosexual women are less likely to have orgasms than everybody else. Mm -hmm. You know? 
And, yeah. and so the sex ed does have something to do with that. And our systems do have something to do with that. When you when you're so tired from all of these things that your job requires of you, like because your labor is being exploited. Sure, it can be harder to enjoy yourself sexually, to realize the health benefits of a good sex life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so let's bring it back to um, BIPOC folks and BIPOC mm-hmm. communities and BIPOC experiences. It's like, we just went real big picture. Right, and we're right, like, right. oh, shit, existential crisis. Okay, this is what needs to happen. So now I am someone, uh, you know, I'm a BIPOC individual listening, or I am uh, in BIPOC communities. So it's like, you know, folks listening who are white folks are in more privileged communities. It's like, okay, we know what we got to do, right? Like if you're on the side of Instagram where you have like the, you know, uh, feminist progressive folks, you know, Mm -hmm. you've seen all the the Mm -hmm. Instagram stories and carousel posts with quotes and stuff. Um, but what are the additional challenges if I'm someone who is, uh, you know, a black woman or I am in a uh, black community? What are the additional challenges to implementing some of these things and making those bigger strides to change the culture? Yeah. So, you know, you get all the sex, like sex magazines and such. And they're like, you've got to prioritize sex in your life. And that's all it takes to have a good sex life. And you got to just learn some things. And, you know, we've named some of those things, but that's not it because there are real things imposing themselves on you, you know, that extracting your energy that kind of cost you and can tax you. So one example I give is most of our research suggests that black women have longer commutes to work. They, They work in more strenuous jobs. They've had a longer history in the employment market than other women of other cultures. And that has implications for how you get to enjoy your sex life. So I have an hour commute to work Mm. each way. If I drive an hour, then work eight to 10 hours and then drive back home an hour. By the end of that day, I put an Instagram post out about this. Like I might be talking good shit about what I'm going to do when I get home, but I'm tired and exhausted. So I don't even have the energy to enjoy like a a nice sexual experience sometimes because of that. That's not uncommon among a lot of Black women. So if you're working in jobs where your labor is exploited, like you're lifting heavier things or the expectations of what you can do, your feminine is not, you know, like people don't see yourself, you as feminine or needing to be protected from hard labor and stuff like that. All of those things kind of seep into how you get to experience your sex life later, the energy you have left for your intimate life. Uh And I think a lot of people miss that because they're like, all you got to do is prioritize it. I'm like, okay, but I also have to prioritize eating. I have to also prioritize like the thing that's going to pay the bills. And we have to just be honest about those, uh, honest about those pieces in the different ways that work looks for women of color than it does for white women. I, I would say one other piece to it is your sense of pleasure worthiness. And so for people of the global majority, I use that term to talk about BIPOC people because we represent 84% of the world's population. So we're really not minorities at all. But if you think about people of the global majority who still experience racial oppression, how resilient is it that you would see yourself as pleasure worthy when the world's trying to tell you otherwise? When the world's trying to suggest to you that you're not beautiful, you're not smart, you are amoral, you are, you know, like all of these stereotypes that we have about people of the global majority, and you still find yourself pleasure worthy anyway. I think that's so resistant. And that means that people of the global majority have so much to teach everyone Uh about what it means to realize pleasure. In my study, we, um, me and my team did the big sex study. And so we surveyed around 500 black people and we asked them how worthy they feel of sexual pleasure and like 90 percent were like a great deal worthy imagine how resilient you you are to see yourself in that way given all the history of racial oppression in this country so we loved that result we were like oh that's remarkable but it says something about even when we're dealing with these systems the work you do in yourself and the way you care about each other in community can really be a buffer against that. Mm, 
God, that is just so like, mwah. and I, I'm amazed at that result. I mean, I, ca I can't imagine like when y'all uncovered that to just be like, whoa, mm -hmm. whoa. And it really is. It's like that ultimate act of resistance, that little, that little slice of pleasure that you have mm. in your life that seems so inconsequential really is that ultimate act of resistance. And it's like, you know, like I like to say, just because I like, I like punny rhymey things, it's subversion through perversion, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and it may not feel like that when you're doing it, but it's like all those little tiny, you know, grains of sand end up making a beach or drops in the bucket, make water or whatever fucking metaphor you want to do. It, it's helping. Keep doing it. <laughs> yes. 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 Okay. And I love that for us. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, okay. Uh, for me, and I, I like, I know a lot of this stuff, you know, but it, even for me, this has been like, who I'm energized. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go have an orgasm for, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to do lots of stuff. I'm going to yes. teach sex ed. I'm going to enjoy my orgasm. I'm going to do the things. Um, so what would you like to leave us with? Like, what didn't we get to that's important or, you know, maybe, a, I don't know, a certain group we want to address? Like, what, what, what do we leave hanging? What's still on the table? So I don't think that we left anything on the table, but I want to reiterate a point about pleasure worthiness, mm -hmm. which is for everyone. It's different than pleasure entitlement because entitlement is how we got to this fucked up place, right? Where you feel like you get to hoard resources and kind of exploit people so that you get what you need at the expense of other people's need. Pleasure worthiness is really a sense of knowing that pleasure is available to you, that you get to share in it, enjoy it, that you are worthy of it in consensual ways and autonomous ways. Mm -hmm. And I want that for everyone. So I want us to get to a place where equity really is and liberation really is a part of our sexual lives. And we realize intimate, just, intimate justice through how we relate to each other sexually. Like we use sex as the playground yeah. for freedom. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Mwah! it's, it's so just, yes, yes. And I want, I want to point something out or just like a thought that came, came through my head that. Uh, and I believe this was sex educator Midori who like planted this seed in my brain. And I was like, oh, I never thought about it that way. Like the word um, entitlement, right? Mm. Like she unpacked entitlement one day as like, I don't know, as a, someone who's socialized a woman, I get, you know, gaslit of like, you're selfish. You're the, mm -hmm. you don't deserve this. You're, you're acting entitled. Right. And that's seen as an insult. And it's like, she pointed out the difference between like my interpretation and experience of entitlement as a woman of color versus mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. entitlement is for like, let's say a, a white cis man. Yeah. Um, so like, I think, and I, I don't know, like, you, you know, you're the, you're the professional, you're, the, you're the therapist and you, you know, all this stuff, but it's like, I don't know how we can like reframe what entitlement means and how we should or should not access it depending on our levels of privilege. I don't know. I haven't quite mm -hmm. thought this out yet. What are your, just your thoughts on that in general? Cause I'm yeah, so curious. That's why I that's why I choose the language of pleasure worthiness as opposed to pleasure entitlement or entitlement to anything. Cause nobody owes you shit. You know, <laughs> like yeah. that's how I feel yeah. about it. You know, that's the, that's the major crux of consent to me. Like, yeah. even if you ask for it, which you deserve, you, you can, you, you, you're worthy of what you ask for, but that doesn't mean I have to give it to you. Maybe I don't have capacity. Maybe I don't have interest, you know, like maybe I don't have time. And so the thing that you want, there's nothing wrong with wanting that. Like if you want to play in a way that I don't want to play, I get to say no. Yeah. Entitled it would mean that you think I should give it to you anyway. You know, yeah. worthiness is like, sure, that person doesn't want to give it to me, but there are other ways I can get that need met because I'm worthy of it. I'm, I shouldn't be ashamed that I have this desire and this need. That's how I make that distinction. Ooh, I love that. So like entitlement versus worthiness that yeah mm -hmm. that's a bit and you know i don't know for people that go oh my goodness you're picking apart words it's semantic but yeah you know that that subconscious meaning sinks yeah. in and that you know so huh, 
this conversation has fed my soul. Oh. Uh, I am so appreciative appreciative of this conversation. I'm so appreciative. I can't even pronounce words. Um, <laughs> so where can we get more of you? Where are all the okay. places? Yeah. I want to be found <laughs> in these places. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you can find me on drcandacenicole.com. That's my website. I'm on Instagram very often at Dr. Candace Nicole. I'm also on YouTube. I got a podcast called Fuck the System. It's a sexual liberation podcast. And I have another podcast called How to Love a Human, where I ask people with racially marginalized and marginalized, multiply marginalized identities, what the world would be like if it loved you. And um, those are the places where I am most frequently found. If you're on Facebook, I'm on there. Sometimes on Twitter, I'm on there sometimes, but I'm definitely on Instagram and definitely on YouTube. Oh, my goodness. Thank you so much. So, so, Thank so you. much. Um, I want to talk to you again. We will figure it out. We will. Yes. Yeah, because these are conversations we need to be having. And we're like at, I mean, we've been at crisis for a while, but we're at like serious, like it's for mm -hmm. real now, like no fucking around. We we're at crisis. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Mwah, until next time. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to American Sex. What's that? You want more? Well, you can start by streaming our TV show on Showtime, Sex with Sunny Megatron. Then pop on over to SunnyMegatron.com. Everything's there. You can get updates on my new book, check out my sex ed and BDSM workshops, learn how to book me for your organization or for coaching. You know, we also want to hang out with you too, right? So come join our Discord community or follow along on TikTok or Instagram, Twitter, all the social media. I'm Sunny Megatron everywhere. And you can catch Ken on Twitter or tune in to his weekly D&D games on Twitch. If you want to support the show, a great way to do that is simply to tell people about it. Make a TikTok or tweet about your favorite part of this episode. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe and leave a review too. And if you're a ride or die American fucker, you're going to want to join our Patreon community. We'll send you official American fucker stickers and you'll get a lot more too at patreon.com slash American sex. Now, just in case you happen to be one of the few that still has disposable income in this late stage capitalist hellscape, well, when you're shopping for a new sex toy, BDSM gear, Kink Academy membership, or other things, please patronize our sponsors and affiliates. You'll get a discount and it helps us too. Win-win. All those links and codes are in our show notes. Thanks, American fuckers. We appreciate the heck out of you. See you next time.